Welcome to the Maintainable Software Podcast, where we speak with seasoned practitioners who have helped organizations work past the problems often associated with technical debt and legacy code. I'm your host, Robbie Russell. On this episode, we are joined by Carolina Essegzer, who is a designer, engineer, photographer, and community organizer. Carolina, welcome to Maintainable. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. So in a recent article that you published, The Technical Debt Myth, you outlined a number of things that people often mislabel with the metaphor technical debt. For example, maintenance work and outgrowing existing solutions. Could you expand on your thesis more? Sure. So this is something that I've been thinking about for a long, long time. I would say from nearly the beginning of my career, this kind of mythical beast of technical debt and what it was. And of course, at the very beginning of my career, I didn't have the understanding nor experience to actually weigh on a subject that big. But more and more, as I was working with different teams, especially remotely, I've realized that people were labeling vastly different things as technical debt, such as maintenance work. And for me, that's not because technical debt is so negative. It's something that like we've consciously made a decision that then kind of is biting us in the future because we've decided to cut corners. For me, a lot of aspects that were lumped into the technical debt area was just kind of the cycle of software engineering or like the cycle of design as well, like maintenance work. Like you have to upgrade your packages. You have to make sure that there are no security vulnerabilities. Like it is technical debt if you made this decision consciously and you know it's there and you kind of taken this route for a reason. But other than that, I feel like it's just kind of natural software engineering or design cycle. It's interesting you touched on the maintenance thing. There's a lot of that stuff. And I think it's a, it's a good point. I think sometimes, even my own experience, I probably have found myself working on some existing software where things that have been updated and, and five to 10 years for some important libraries in the application and might prematurely just call that, oh, technical debt. There's some debt here thinking we're going to have to clean this up at some point. But I think you're right that it's not always something that someone made like necessarily made a conscious decision like, oh, we're going to stop upgrading or keeping this updated. It's just maybe there's a lack of process probably within that the team that was responsible for it. So on the flip side of that, what do you believe are a few healthy characteristics of a maintainable software code base? Oh, that's a, that's a difficult one. Let me start with kind of taking this question a little bit backwards. What isn't a healthy code base? So a lot of approaches that I see in the community and the teams that I've worked at and community as well at large when running events for especially the JavaScript community is like this excitement about new technologies, which is very healthy and it's great. But I feel like when your approach to software engineering, the first thing that you think is like, there's a new technology, let's find a way how to use it in our project. That's kind of like a backwards approach. Like that isn't a sign of a healthy project or a healthy code base to me, because it's kind of trying to like, oh, we're really excited about this technology. So let's just find a way to shoehorn it into our code base. Like that's kind of not an approach for lasting software or like having teams that are live in consensus because it's usually someone who gets excited by the particular project like React or GraphQL. I don't know, something that's new and very kind of like exciting for people. So I think a sign for kind of healthy software engineering project or a code base, we could get, go very new degree. It's like, how fast does it start? How difficult it is to set up for someone who's being onboarded? How difficult is it to contribute or like talk about the time from like developing a feature to releasing the features is incredibly complex to do that, depending on the skill and the person contributing. So I feel like there are many factors that we could be discussing here in terms of like what, what is a sign of a good software engineering approach is like a maintainable one. Right. One of the things you touched on there was about new technology and people, like the developers that would get really excited about new technology. And admittedly, that's part of why it kind of prompted me to think about this topic a bit more and sort of podcast on it, because I don't feel like there's a, enough conversation about like, let's make sure we take care of the stuff we already created and not just keep going to the new shiny thing. I've often wondered if we create a, some level of technical debt when we go experiment with new technology on new projects because we could, or we replace something with some new technology because there's not enough confidence in baked in experience with that platform just yet. And so you might end up making a lot of those early 
mistakes or oversights because you're not, not that they're mistakes, but just you don't know yet where the, what are best practices necessarily there yet if there's not a lot of established best practices. And I know this has been, at least is something that I've seen with like React in particular over the last several years, because there's a lot of, it's not a highly opinionated framework. So there's a lot of different ways people approach it. And there's not really one way to say like, well, who's wrong or who's right necessarily, but who's straying from the set of conventions or not. So I always wonder how much we as a community are dealing with what I've heard people refer to as resume driven development, where you're trying to accumulate all these new technologies, add them to, so you can have those on your resume. I mean, not to say that you're not interested and excited about playing with new technology, but if you're not interested in taking care of the stuff that's already there, then that's maybe a different type of developer, but we do need that in our industry quite a bit more, I think, because we can't just keep creating new code all the time just for the sake of someone being excited. Yeah, I definitely see that quite a lot. And it's funny because I feel like I'm maybe a part of the old guard of the web, like people who have been around a bit and seen the rise of JavaScript, especially because I feel like that's kind of the best example to be discussing this. In a lot of cases, you're right. People just jump on new technologies because they're excited about them or it looks like it's going to solve their problems or they want to have it on their resume. But what I feel like they don't think about is like, well, the current thing that we're using, the current technology is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It serves our customers well, but then like we're trying to shoehorn this new thing just for the sake of the fact that it's new, which isn't to me like that's not a valid like I mean it is a valid reason, but I don't know like if I was a product lead or like if I was leading a company, that for me wouldn't be like a good enough reason to like invest so much in new technology that you know you can't predict whether it's going to be really good. Is it going to fulfill your requirements or not? Because you don't have that experience yet. It's true. How has technical debt impacted the teams that you've been part of? I would say the impact that technical debt had was mostly time. I've seen a lot of projects massively delayed because of kind of hastily made decisions or lack of documentation or conscious decision making that was, well, this is going to make us do those things faster that we are trying to achieve, but there are going to be drawbacks. But it was kind of like, thinking that those drawbacks won't be as big. They won't outweigh the the benefit. I would say that for me, it was mostly like the difficulty of contribution, the difficulty of setting up a code base, the difficulty of being able to release, which are kind of like the basic of software engineering. Like you have to be able to, especially in like remote scenario, because I've worked remotely for eight to 10 years now. So it's really important to have documentation, to have code bases that you will be able to contribute basically on your own without any help whatsoever, because you might not have any help in your time zone. So it's really important to have not only documentation, but maintainable software, which you can kind of work with day to day without anyone's assistance. Are there some patterns to creating good documentation, given that you are primarily working remotely and you're touching on documentation, like getting the application up and running in, say, your local development environment or however you're approaching that? What are some characteristics of a good like setup or readme guide on that for a peer in your team? Well, I would say that a lot of principles are kind of just good writing principles. So keep it short, keep it brief, keep it understandable. Don't try to write a scientific essay <laughs> because some people might get confused of it, especially if we're talking about people who, you know, English isn't their first language. Like for me, mm. it is. And I have no problems with it, but I've seen other people struggle. So be brief, be very concise. Don't use very complicated language. Structure it in a very good way, which is obviously headings, bullet points. That's very scannable, very friendly to go kind of like step by step. And it's usually step by step instructions. And I think one of the problems that I notice with documentation very frequently is someone will embark on a mission of, I'm going to write the best like document read me for this project ever. And they do, and it's really great, but then they never come back to it. They never update it. And things are in flux perpetually. So that documentation becomes out of date very quickly. So I would say that keeping documentation up to date is one of the most important things because I've definitely found myself multiple times being like, oh, this doesn't work and that doesn't work. And then you have to circle back with the person and it kind of defeats the purpose of having documentation in the first place. What about documentation within the code base itself in terms of what, what do you think, you know, there's always that balance of like too much documentation for being just enough. What do you think are some important things to consider when you actually decide to write a couple of lines of comments related to some code you're committing? I'm definitely a huge fan of that. I've definitely caught myself 
being in a code basis where nothing was documented in the code itself and just wondering what something did and going into a like two hour rabbit hole just to figure it out whether it could be refactored or removed because let's say that you're working on like kind of like a clean up refactor tasks. So I do think they could be incredibly helpful if they're brief and if they're in the right places. I think for instance, in terms of specific languages, like for JavaScript, they're helpful. They're helpful for testing. I've seen them being very helpful for Ruby, for Node as well, which are kind of like the environments that I found myself in. HTML, CSS, not so much. It's pretty self explanatory unless you're kind of just like sectioning the code so it's really easy to scan without looking for the elements that can be helpful as well. I'm definitely a fan. Revisiting one of the topics from your article, how does process fit into a healthy code base? Like what are some good practices that you've seen implemented in your teams or where do you think some often processes are usually lacking in teams maybe as a follow-up? Well, I think one of the first kind of like processy approaches is just thorough review because I feel like I've seen it in a lot of teams where there's nobody to review pull requests or someone is just kind of glancing over it or never running it and they're like, eh, yeah, that looks fine, approve because they don't feel like it's their responsibility to like kind of be responsible for the code that's being shipped because they are just a reviewer. So I feel like there's no sense of like shared responsibility for what we're shipping. So I think quality assurance and kind of peer review is very important because we all make silly mistakes. Sometimes the only person that can spot them is someone who didn't work on that particular piece of software or design, someone who has a fresh perspective. But I feel like we don't, in a lot of cases, in a lot of teams, I've seen peer reviews being like kind of a formality, like we do them, but it's just someone glancing for two minutes and not really like taking the time to be thorough with reviews. So that's one thing. And I guess the second thing would be all of the tools that we can employ to automate quality assurance for processes so like the linters, performance, accessibility testing, all the things that we kind of shouldn't be doing manually. They should be done automatically, either at like commit level or pull request level. But it's really astonishing how many teams do not employ like kind of standard practices for quality assurance. It's just like a massive afterthought, especially I think in performance and accessibility space. When you're talking about performance, what sort of things are you often checking for? Can you give me some like couple of quick tangible examples of how that might be useful to bake into your like CI build process? There is a set of kind of crucial performance metrics that especially refer to the user experience, such as the Lighthouse performance score, which is kind of like an aggregate performance overall score. There's time to interactive, first contentful pain, first meaningful pain. And all of those metrics will kind of help you understand what the user experience is when someone is visiting either your app or your website, whatever you're building. So you're basically looking for regressions in timing on kind of like either testing like synthetic on deploy or testing in PR, PRs using kind of like CI. What are some examples of broken processes that you've experienced outside of, say, weak pull request processes? Are there other areas in teams that you've seen where it's created technical debt or not really addressed the fact that there is some technical debt? Oh, many, many, many. I think one of the things that just pops into my mind straight away pretty much is, I guess, just general approach to shipping software or just shipping products in general, which is that notion of either MVP or just like shipping fast or as fast as possible and just ensuring that the priority is to ship something very fast, ship a product, ship a new feature, but not ship it right, so to say, in a sense of like making sure that it's maintainable, making sure it's well tested, making sure it's documented very well. I still am yet to see like a very thorough approach. I've seen a lot of companies at very different sizes. And many times I expected like really long kind of processes for, for release and very like kind of thorough testing and QA, but it just wasn't present. Like it's to me, it was just really surprising that I could see that kind of level of just like kind of winging it <laughs> kind of perpetually in the industry, like kind of that ship it as fast as possible approach. Do you think that often is a sign of the company's culture that maybe after they get past that initial release of their software product, whether it's that's their business or a component of their business, but you know, I think there's a lot of like, energy around building things as quickly as possible to get things out the door right away to see if there's a test test that's actually going to get some product market fit or something. But do you feel like there should be more time spent on some of those issues earlier on, like those potential issues where 
doing more of a thorough QA process or just having more best practices put in place, when is the right time for a company to kind of evaluate that really seriously? Like, I think some people might be like, well, in this early startup phase, we don't know if this is even worth doing yet. We think it is, but there's kind of like that transition phase as they grow. And, and I guess if you don't go back and fix that, that can become problematic. But what's what's been your experience there? I definitely agree. It depends on the stage the company is in. Like it would be vastly different for an early stage startup or like a bootstrap company versus a company that is on Series D, a thousand people or like about to IPO. Like these are very different scenarios. And don't get me wrong, I ship things all the time quite fast. So I'm very kind of well versed in that. And I guess in terms of like my working history as well, like I've worked a lot at a lot of early stage startups. So I'm like, I know how this culture of shipping works. But I think where it becomes problematic at any stage of a company is where we're not thoroughly testing for malice and exploitation of the software that we built, or we don't think about how the software can put someone at danger or exclude them. And this is something that we see in tech, especially nowadays, quite a bit. So it's not even for me about like making sure that the software or design we ship is just pixel perfect or the software is just so great that just nobody can put a finger on it. It's about making sure that the people we are shipping for can firstly use it and like have a great experience with it, but also their data is protected, their identity is protected, and they feel welcome on that platform that they're using. And that's kind of the angle that I'm kind of usually thinking about and worried about. Is that a typical thing from your experience like as an engineer, or is that another aspect of a kind of a different role that starts to think about those factors a little bit more? I mean, that stems from not only my community organizing, but my involvement in diversity inclusion kind of activism in general. But I think those kind of like, let's call it humane tech and like ethical mm -hmm. tech values is something that I hold very dearly. So I try to think about it in kind of every aspect of my existence in tech as a professional. You know, you touched on accessibility an example. Are there some good tools that you've been able to use over in your career in the last few years that you could recommend to other people on being better at testing, things like that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of both accessibility and performance, the kind of sad truth about it is that people often leave it at the very end. They've already shipped something and then somebody says, well, have you tested I don't know, our accessibility score and someone goes in and oops, nobody tested it. So I feel like the primary problem is with the fact that like we leave it at the very end because it just doesn't feel important enough for people who are kind of like building software and building the web in general. There are definitely a lot of really good tools. Lighthouse is one of them. It's a Chrome extension. It's built into DevTools. It's a CLI and a lot of products, including Calibre run on suits kind of comprise of Lighthouse as well, which gives you not only performance, but also accessibility and SEO advice. So obviously that's a very good tool that you can integrate at many levels of your kind of engineering cycle. In terms of accessibility specifically, there are also a lot of the extensions. One of them is called Axe, which is very comprehensive in terms of accessibility testing. These are kind of the two on top of my mind, kind of high level accessibility work. Circling back around again to technical debt and maintainable code, you touched on a few things related to how developers will often mislabel things. Let's say they're actually talking about something that is actually technical debt. It was a decision that someone made at once. Like, okay, we're going to go ahead and live with this for a while, but we need to go back and clean this up. How have you seen that handled well when it comes to prioritizing that stuff? If the stakeholders are aware of it, but they're maybe not necessarily prioritizing it. Like, what's some advice that you could offer developers on how to get that on their radar and, and actually be able to, to address it. So I wish I had like really great advice. Like I wish I had a story that worked just perfectly and somebody just went, yeah, I agree with you. This is, we should address it right now, but that has never happened in my career. However, there are ways of kind of rephrasing technical debt and having that conversation with like PMs or managers to get it prioritized. I feel like one of the first kind of pieces of advice. And I've mentioned that in my article as well. It's like developer frustration. So a lot of ways people approach technical debt is like, I'm frustrated with the software. I don't want to work on it anymore. I want to work in React, not in whatever else I'm working in right now or something else, some new technology. Like that kind of approach isn't going to convince anyone, even if it's valid, like it's not going to convince anyone that this is important. 
I think one of the really important strategies or that kind of mindsets to put yourself into if you're a developer is like, how do I think about this as a product owner or a business owner? What this change is going to bring to my customers or to my internal team, if it's like, let's say, like an internal tool that we're working on. What kind of benefits? How long will it take? Like you have to do some basic research before you come to a manager or a product owner with that kind of pitch. And I feel like this is true not only for technical debt, but like new ideas as well. I feel like the more details you can provide saying, this is the problem we're seeing. This is how it's manifesting itself. These are the drawbacks and negatives and like impact on our team or our customers. This is how we think it could be solved. This is probably how much time we need. Like if you have all this information for you as a product owner or a manager, this is just kind of a no-brainer because you already have all the information that you need. But if someone is coming to you with like kind of negative approach and not giving you any details and not giving you any context, for you as a manager, like you can't really do anything with that information. So I would say be as specific as you can, do some research, prepare maybe like a spec doc outlining. Is that also usually works in remote scenarios because you can't just have face-to-face meetings all the time. So yeah, bring as much context as you possibly can and just try to put yourself in shoes of like a manager or a product owner or a business owner and like the impact that this work could potentially have. Yeah, I don't think we can state that how important that is in terms of trying to change it into thinking about not necessarily all the positives that will come about, you know, the proposed change or things you're going to be addressing. I think you made a lot of really good points there and often seen that scenario where you get that kind of developers that come across like they're being kind of a curmudgeon about the code base or whatever. And then, but they've complained about things a lot of times and they're not necessarily like, it's not always like people in that position to like, what do you want me to do about that? I'm going to solve your problem or, and I think there's always another part of me always wonders that if developers, because they, they maybe throughout their career, they've asked a few times like, Hey, can we deal with this? They get a response of, not right now, maybe later too many times. And so they stop asking and they just assume that whoever they're talking to doesn't care anymore. I always wonder if there's not enough conversation about ownership of the code base and the technical thing. Like those people are hiring us as developers to care about that stuff we don't need to ask their permission to do the right things for them, but sometimes we might need to like at least get some permission about prioritizing some aspects to it. I think that as an industry could do a bit better, actually not even just a little bit better job, a lot better of a job there because it, we're not really serving our own best interest because I think if you would ask most stakeholders, like is quality important to you? Then we need to do these types of things. This is what we'll take to have a quality code base. Why would anyone need to ask for permission to, say, write tests or to do things like that if they don't have them yet? So it's like, a, is that, I don't know if it's a scapegoat thing. I don't think developers are intentionally trying to hide away from those things. But it, it is their responsibility, I believe, to be an advocate for the, the long-term health of their code base. I think you touched on a lot there. You know, we talked a little bit about... Uh, you know, existing stuff and not being necessarily always excited by the latest new trends and stuff. But are there things in in the software industry that you're kind of excited about learning more about in the near future? I wish I had like a really exciting answer to that. But no, as I've said, I'm pretty kind of like old guard web person. So I do like whatever is kind of really thoroughly tested. I mean, I did work in the Node community, like in the Node community and Node um, environments very early on. And I did start using React fairly early as well. And I think those technologies are great, but I'm definitely not a person who will read about like a new framework or a new technology and get instantly excited about it. Like I just, I just prefer to like research a lot and then make sure that whatever I'm using is actually beneficial, not only to my team company, but also the product that I'm building. I'll be back with my interview with Carolina in just a moment. Hi, it's me, Robbie. I wanted to thank you for listening to the Maintainable Software Podcast. If you're finding these conversations valuable, interesting, you get the idea, please consider sharing it amongst your peers and writing a review on Apple Podcasts to help spread the word. Also, if you have a good story or two to share about ways to help the long-term maintainability of software and might be interested in being a guest, please get in touch with me at Robbie with a Y at maintainable.fm. And now back to our interview with Carolina Exeger. Are there any like other related topics that you feel like would be interested in trying to have a moment that this might have sparked up or you had a story or something that might be worth quickly touching on? When I think about technical debt and I guess this like narrative of not having time or not having buy-in 
for doing some types of work. Like I always think about accessibility and performance because accessibility right now, like it's still not getting as much attention as it should be. Performance is because Google thinks it's important. Therefore, it's enforcing it. So people now think it's important. But like, it's kind of like an arbitrary thing that's trickling down from Google that, you know, like people have to listen to it because they want SEO. So I think it's an interesting narrative to be like constantly fighting and like having to become an advocate for a certain thing to be able to make it happen. And yeah, performance and accessibility are kind of like really good examples here because I often, especially like working in performance space, I hear this all the time, like, well, we really want to use your tool, but like, help me convince my company that this is important. I'm like, I shouldn't be doing this. It is really important. Like... And there are so many materials out there for you to like know that it's important, but like you have to do this job. Same with, I guess, technical debt. Like pitch me how you're going to solve my problems or what problems are you going to solve for me by like me allocating time to this initiative. So I guess they're just like really similar. You mentioned earlier that you focus in your community organizing related to diversity inclusion and also thinking about the ethics of the type of work that we're doing and some of, from a values perspective, where do you feel like that should be originating from? Like people, should that just be from everybody in the team? Like, do you think we need more developers in the community to, to raise this as an issue? Or does this need to come from all sides? Are you secretly hoping that Google at one point will start modifying their SEO rankings based off of how accessible say a website or application is? Is that our one like true hope forward for that? I'm hopeful that it will come from not only like personal level, but kind of like organizational level as well. Like it will become the important thing. Like you said, if you ask someone, do you care about quality? Obviously the answer will be like, yeah, I care about quality. Like I don't want to release anything that's subpar or like not adequate for the web, but you just don't see it in practice. So I guess it's similar to this metaphor that you see all the time with startups. And like you go to an about page of a startup or a company and they talk about all of those grand values they have but they don't exercise them in many cases. So like for me, those statements about values are useless if you're not exercising them. So you can't say like, oh, I care about security or I care about performance or accessibility if you're not like intentionally working on it. Like they're just kind of meaningless statements that work great for PR and kind of like outward facing in marketing initiatives or like kind of attracting talent, but it doesn't work for the web at large at all. You've worked at various companies over the years and companies will have the organization's values, whether how much they align with those or not in day-to-day practice. But have you also seen like engineering teams themselves and or design teams come up with their own kind of their own set of values? Yes, I definitely have worked at companies that had like engineering teams would have engineering principles, design teams will have kind of like their guiding values or product values that they kind of exercise on their own level because you just kind of need that level of detail and context and kind of being granular specifically targeted towards that team because those overall values that companies state are usually so generic and high level that they make sense for organization they attract people that i guess are interested in those values primarily but they don't have that much application in terms of, I guess, specific themes. I mean, they might in terms of, like, let's say, diversity inclusion or ethics, but I feel like you need to be more specific on, uh, more specific on the team level. Can you give me a couple of examples of some principles or values for those that might not have had an experience of that and maybe are curious about maybe proposing that to their team? I've definitely seen a lot of, especially in engineering teams about like values or or like principles surrounding not having egos, being humble, always ensuring that you ask for feedback, like kind of still high level, more than personal traits rather than engineering Mm -hmm. principles. Like I've seen a lot of kind of engineering principles in terms of like, you should always write tests or you should always do X, Y, Z. So I've seen a lot of a lot of those, but I feel like primarily they were actually values or principles surrounding behaviors and kind of describing how to be a good person on a given team, which is interesting, kind of like coaching engineers or designers to like be a good collaborator and teammate rather than being prescriptive about this is how we do engineering or this is how we do design. I've always wondered about how engineering teams might approach that and admittedly my own team doesn't have necessarily a 
solid set of list of principles or we have our company values. We're not like a huge company. So it feels like we all kind of get it. But I've had people recently ask, what are our values when it comes to our engineering team? And I'm like, that's a good question. Nobody really asked me that. And I haven't seen it done because my career, I didn't have that in my past few jobs. And so I'm like, oh, what is, what would that look like? And or why is that important? How, it hasn't been a problem to date. So I'm always curious about how that's, that stuff manifests in different organizations. So wrapping up a few last quick questions, let's imagine there's a couple of developers that are out there listening. Maybe they just recently onboarded to a project and there's only maybe one or two of the original developers still around that are more in senior roles, or maybe they're now managing the team and don't spend a lot of time coding these days. And there's a lot of technical debt, at least they perceive as technical debt, or they hear people talking about technical debt in the application. Like, Don't go into those corners because of the application, you're going to have some problems, but at least know that they're there. They're kind of nervous about how they should start approaching like, well, I don't want to start want to rock the boat by complaining and saying, I have some ideas how to fix these things, but they do. So what sort of advice might you offer them on to how to start approaching that within their new team? When you're onboarding at a new company, there is a certain period of time, and it of course depends on the size of the code base that you're working on and the size of the company, whether it's a tiny startup or it's a well-established company that has been around for 10 years and has like a thousand employees. It will take time for you to like familiarize yourself, not only with the code base itself, but also the, the kind of team processes and as well as kind of the decision-making that went into making certain I guess, development and software engineering decision-making. So I feel like even if you spot something right away and you feel like it's wrong, it would be probably reasonable to sit with it and spend some time trying to learn like how the team works, how this code base works, why does it look that way in those specific corners that you might be worried about. So just having patience and not kind of jumping into assumptions very fast, especially as you onboard. If that problem persists after a few months and you really feel like it should be addressed, again, transparency, context, having conversations with project owners, having conversations with people who might have worked on that feature or that part of the code base, try to find reasoning, try to find a way forward in a constructive way. I think like being constructive and having data is usually something that pretty much anyone will respond to. So if you're being vague and especially like negative about, even if it's like it's a real pain and it's hard to work with and it is frustrating, being negative usually it doesn't yield the desired effects. So I guess kind of trying to maintain this optimism, trying to gather the data, talk to relevant people and kind of present a solution rather than just be flagging problems. Yeah, I think you make some good points there about, you know, coming in and not being like, try to be a, I think I've always cautioned people to not come in and try to not have the hero complex in some ways, but like, I, I'm going to come in and start complaining or at least bring up all these things. I'm going to fix everything right away. Cause I think there's important to, as you, you were saying about being patient and sit with it for a little bit, understand how this all fits together and then start navigating your way through that process. Once you've kind of understand how that team works but also there's on the flip side, when you join a company too, you also have this advantage of having fresh perspective on that code base. And that is a really valuable thing too. So you want to be mindful to not just completely fall into the trap of like, now you're following the way everything has been done. And so if there's some processes missing in that team that you might be able to kind of help shape if they haven't created them, I think it's always like the one thing when you have technical debt, how does that organization actually handle it? Does it just sit around for a long time? Is there a backlog? Is there some way, like there's a list of these things that at some point we might need to go back and approach these things if we feel like it's warranted, but just don't start jumping into making a bunch of assumptions, but also to communicate with the peers that you've, you've spotted it. You're okay living with it for right now, but hopefully share that same perspective that it may need to get addressed at some point if it's, you know, if it's slowing down the team's velocity or their ability to just make contributions or deploy things or what other many different issues that could come up related to technical debt. So two last quick questions for you. What book do you find yourself most often recommending to people in our industry? I feel like I could recommend like 20 of them. <laughs> but what came to me first, and I'm just going to roll with it, is a book entitled Radical Candor. And it is a book about being honest and being candid and communication. Especially in the remote scenario, it's very relevant, but in general, as a tech industry and as people who spend a lot of time on the internet and not communicating face-to-face, -face, I feel like real good communication is kind of, I don't want to say disappearing, but it is hard to come by. 
And I feel like having empathy for people that you're working with or communicating with and being really candid, but without actually hurting people isn't something that a lot, a lot of people possess. So I would say Radical Candle is a great book that I would recommend. And it also will probably help you with discussing technical debt. Excellent. And where can people learn more about you online? I'm at Fox at Twitter. It's not a Fox News account. That's probably where you can find <laughs> me. Excellent. Well, it's been such a delight having you on Maintainable, Carolina. Thank you for so much for joining us. Thank you so much.